Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. The more variables that you can give yourself to control, the better, which means finding other interests, finding other passions in the business or out of the business, and letting those fill you as a human so that the only validation you're looking for in life is not coming from acting. Hello and welcome to Tuesday, a special Tuesday episode of In the Envelope. Welcome, listeners. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, we have such a treat for you today with actor, writer, producer, all-around content creator, and just genius of the biz, survivalist hustler, Dan Bukatinsky, who I put through the ringer in terms of asking him about how to become a content creator how to write your own roles, what to do, including in a amid a global pandemic, you know, what actors in particular, but really anyone who wants to break into the biz can do uh, to put themselves on the map. Um, he has a very multifaceted approach and philosophy to life that I personally found helpful. But listeners, I'm going to be real with you for a second. When this crisis hit, we at Backstage, we knew that this podcast could very much pivot to audio only. We've recorded plenty of interviews, especially at the beginning of this podcast, which is almost three years ago, with just over the phone or just, uh, you know, over audio uh, remotely. And But I did have my doubts in this new phase of the podcast because um, in-person interviews in general are deeper. They're better. They're, they're more personal. There's, you know, you're able to go in many more different directions. It's more of a conversation. So I had some trepidation about transitioning this podcast to entirely remote interviews. And I got to say, this Dan Bukatinsky interview today is a perfect example of proving me wrong. I mean, we are still able to hear wisdom from these guests and amazing, specific, practical advice, and also just general inspiration and even hope in these uncertain times. And the fact that we are not in the same room has not really inhibited that. So I'm excited for you to hear all of the many recordings we've banked over the last several weeks. Um, We have so many, in fact, that they are going to be airing on not just Thursdays, but on many a Tuesday for the next coming months as well as we lead up to the Emmy Award nominations on uh, July 28th. But um, special shout out to producer Jamie Muffet this week for uh, (laughs) who's always a whiz with editing, you know, especially these remote interviews. Today's in particular, though, there was there was quite a bit of wizardry. In general, I think the audio for these for these recordings, again, has been like way better than I expected. But yeah, I'm going to stop blabbing and have Dan sort of take over. Dan is also a huge fan of Backstage. And of course, with many of our guests, I do make them relive their early days. He has some great tidbits about his early days and how... Uh, His dream about a life in the arts started off as one thing, became quite another thing, became yet another thing. Uh, Dreams change and evolve. And uh, Dan's thoughts on that were articulated in a way that I've never quite heard. So stay tuned. We're going to take a quick break. And I can't wait for you all to hear this. Huntsville, Alabama in 1946, a city that was as American as Apple Strudel from LA Times Studios comes Paperclip, a podcast sponsored by Amazon Studios and inspired by its Emmy-eligible dramatic series, Hunters, starring Al Pacino and Logan Lerman. Join host Michael Ian Black as he teams up with a Cold War scholar to explore Operation Paperclip, a real-life, top-secret program that brought Nazi scientists to the American heartland 
to work on government aerospace and medical research projects. Available now on Apple Podcasts and all other platforms. Writer, producer, actor, and advocate Dan Bukatinsky has pursued and created his own opportunities to become a Hollywood hyphenate. His multifaceted approach includes everything from executive producing The Comeback and Web Therapy with Lisa Kudrow, to writing the memoir Does This Baby Make Me Look Straight, to winning an Emmy Award for his performance on Shonda Rhimes' Scandal. Dan currently stars on ABC's comedy drama The Baker and the Beauty, Here's our chat with the brilliant Dan Bukatinsky. Thank you so much for joining us on Backstages in the Envelope podcast. Um, I have so much to actually ask you about. I actually (laughs) don't really know where to begin. First of all, do you know Backstage? Were you familiar with us? Did you ever use Backstage? Oh my God. Backstage, uh, was my, when I was first out of college and, uh, living in New York, it was all about backstage. Uh, great. So, so I have a long, long, long history with backstage and as a resource, um, it was in my twenties, uh, something that, that was kind of the lifeline, you know, to, Mm. to the business for, for me. And obviously it's evolved over the years. Um, mm-hmm. as we all have, but, uh, but no, absolutely. I have a long history with backstage and a, and a, it's got a warm place in my heart, <laughs> both as the uh-huh. place where the things I did not get and the things that I did happened. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. The, the ratio is, there's a ratio of, of what you get and what you don't get. Sure. And the point is to get out there and make it happen. So yes, that is yes. very good to hear. Second of all, I am also a graduate of Vassar College oh, from class of 2012. And so me selfishly, I would love to hear about your experience, but also of course, you know, how that plays into your whole, your whole career. Well, I, um, I graduated, uh, a few years before you, um, Uh (laughs) just a couple. Um, (laughs) but Vassar was a very, uh, you know, here's the thing. I, 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 was so all over the place out of high school. I applied to way more colleges and universities than I should have. And I applied to big schools and small schools and Midwestern schools and East Coast schools. Like there was no rhyme or reason to it. I was all over the map. Uh And it was almost like, and I'm not that spiritual of a person, but in many ways it was like the universe was taking care of me because I wound up at Vassar College, which which was exactly where I needed to be. It was a small, And as you know, it's a small liberal arts college that allowed me to sort of explore what it meant to be a thinking human being, Mm. uh, 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 an expressive, you know, to find a voice, whether you're writing a paper or whether you're running an organization or in a theater group or whether you're studying or whether talking to faculty, all those pivotal moments that happen between 18 and 22 happening in such Mm. a small enclosed campus was a was a real blessing to me mm-hmm. um it was also a place where i was allowed to pick a multi-disciplinary major which mm-hmm. like the rest of my life and the theme of my add self allowed oh. me to allowed me to sort of major in something that had multi uh, disciplines, uh, uh, many disciplines merged together which was the mm-hmm. beginnings of me becoming a hyphenate um, right and so I really credit the college and my experience there for allowing me to figure out a way that I could have, you know, many different uh, items off of my breakfast menu, which is something that I've always loved to do. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and to this day, you know, I continue to act and produce and write. And some of it has to do with just trying to make a living any way that I can. And mm-hmm. some of it has to do with just wanting to express various aspects of uh, be, being a, an entertainment content maker, creative mm-hmm. person. Um, and so the beginnings of that was really in college where I was sort of encouraged to take a multidisciplinary approach to something. And I think mm-hmm. I've done that for the rest of my life. 
yeah, that slightly ADD approach works well in liberal arts school. And then I love that you just use the term hyphenate because that's very much how, how we think of you. And I almost sort of thought that was a term that, like, I know the backstage team, we kind of use that term to refer to people who, who wear lots of different hats. And it's yes. good to hear that you, I mean, is this, is, has that been the goal from the beginning? You want to specialize in a lot of different areas of the biz? You know, uh, I, I, I'm trying to remember, you know, I, I think in my 20s, I just really wanted to work. I was in New York. And I think I graduated Vassar and I wanted to, I went to every open call that I felt I was right for. Um, I can't remember what day of the week backstage would come out, but it was like on the newsstand uh-huh. sometimes, sometimes the night before. I, I want to say Thursday mornings or something. And, yeah. you know, I, I'd go to Wednesday night at midnight and see if I can get one hot off the presses and cool. circle circle those those opportunities. And I, I was taking singing and dancing and acting classes and I wanted to be in a Broadway musical and I was really down that path. Mm. And pretty soon I started taking classes with the Groundlings and different improv groups and mm. learning to write sketches and become someone who could create opportunity. Uh, again, some of this was inadvertent, you know, like it was just like right. I wasn't working. So I started writing sketch shows that I could perform in, you know, sometimes in your 20s, the very act of not being able to get a job is what hmm. pushes you and forces you to become a person who gets who gives yourself the opportunity. And um, it has sort of been my guiding light for decades. Um, hmm. I have never really you know, I've, I've heard no many more times than I've heard yes. And so mm-hmm. writing as a means to acting was a sort of survival skill. So I automatically became a hyphenate in that I was writing material for myself to perform in. And then there was no one else who cared enough about those productions to get them publicized. Gotcha. So I inadvertently became a producer. And so being a 22 year old who's writing material and then acting in it with other actors and then trying to get the word out and get them in the paper and find a theater and print programs, suddenly you realize, you wake up one day and realize that you've been producing. So those (laughs) skills emerged in me as a survival, as a way of making sure that I can continue to do what I love to do. And so I don't know if I set out to be a hyphenate, but I think it happened. And it was lucky that it did because then it allowed me to do those things sometimes at the exact same time. And sometimes it allowed me to just just be a producer on one thing, just be a writer on something. And I certainly I certainly welcome the opportunity, as I have with The Baker and the Beauty, which is the show that I'm currently on, to just be an actor sometimes. Right. If that if it's not multiple hats and it's just one hat, then that's very doable for you. It is. And it I have to sort of readjust my expectations uh, sometimes when I am, you know, when I'm on a set and I'm just acting and, you know, you have to sort of keep keep yourself in check because in many ways, the actor is the lowest guy on the totem pole when it comes to sure. leverage and power and creative control. And both that's liberating in a way. And sometimes it's frustrating when you've certainly been on the other side of it. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 That's actually really interesting because I, I was wondering about that in terms of when you are just acting, as you say, it is quite a bit less. I mean, if you're, if what you're used to is having a little bit more creative control, certainly over something like the comeback where it's all coming from you and your, your brain. And as far as a hierarchy of power goes, like what happens on that set is largely up to you. Well, yeah, the comeback was tricky because we were so many collaborators. I mean, it was created mm-hmm. by, written by Lisa Kudrow and Michael Patrick King. And I was an executive producer with Lisa. So my mm-hmm. role had far more to do with less of the writing and creating of the series. I got to act on the show, which was always such a welcome uh, departure from my other job on that show, which was to manage uh, re- uh, relationship and communication with the network, gotcha. uh, you know, casting, all these other aspects of being a producer. Sometimes they're not as to have your brain filled with all those problems when you're when you're in doing a scene. Mm. Um, you really you really have to be able to separate, and that's become something that I've learned to do more and more. Right, interesting. Yeah, I, I do like asking 
as you say, the hyphenates, like, do you think of it as compartmentalization where you have a producer hat on and then you switch to an actor hat, for example, and you're saying it's maybe not helpful to wear both at the, or try to wear both at the same time? Yeah, well, when you're hired to write and you're just a writer on something and you then try to be more than that or you your impulse is to do more than that, it right. it occasionally is helpful because my experience sometimes will guide me. But there are other people who are producing when you're just writing or when you're just acting. Mm-hmm. And it is, <laughs> I'm a bit of a control freak, so it's much harder for me to let sure. other people do their jobs when I want to do it. But like on The Baker right. and the Beauty, you know, I was an actor in a cast of eight. Um, but there were times when I had been down that road before uh, in different ways uh, of things happening behind the scenes. And so, you know, I was certainly a voice of um, advice or guidance to the rest of the cast when certain things were happening. But uh, but I was not a, I'm not a producer on that show. And, and uh, it, it is good for me to um, keep my eyes on my own page. I'm learning that as a right. parent as well these days. Sure. Um, it's good to let people do their own thing. Sure. And uh, like you said, to the extent that you're, you know, to some extent you're trying to find, you're trying to make a living and you're, you're going for the work, wherever the work leads you. But do you try to do yes. that thing of, okay, this is just an acting job, but I would also like to have maybe at the same time or maybe coming up just a writing gig or just a producing gig. Do you try to do, to have a little bit of that sprinkled out? Oh, my God, yes. I mean, and a lot of that has to do with my ADD brain, but a lot of that also has to do with my experience. You know, I, uh, my career took a turn that was the turn I was sort of always dreamed it might in my 20s. It happened for me more in my 40s, which isn't to say I wasn't working for all those years. I was. I, I you know, I made a movie in my 30s, and I, I have acted on many different shows throughout my career. But in terms of the kind of attention for acting that I was always hoping I would get happened in my, you know, at 46, I think, or 47. And so by that point, I had already learned how important it is to be able to have other things to fall back on, to not count on one show. You know, I was on 29 episodes of Scandal, 28 episodes of Scandal, but you know, my role in that did not last beyond three seasons. And then I was on another show that was short lived on NBC. And then, you know, acting jobs and and series in general are so volatile and so unpredictable, as is everything in the business, that I learned very early on out of necessity that to just put all my eggs in one basket was certainly never going to serve me. So a lot of the times I am hoping to have other things that I'm working on that will keep multiple trains going so that should one of them fall away, which is so likely, not just not because of the quality of the work or the potential of that project, but because of just the odds. I certainly want to be able to continue paying for my kids' education. So there's the financial aspect of it, but there's also this idea that you don't want to just have the, the ground fall out from under you and you're suddenly just waiting for the phone to ring for a year. I mean, that's, that's a feeling that many of us have as young actors in our teens and early 20s that I would never want to repeat. So I've often gotten this comment like, oh my God, you have so many jobs. Why don't you save some for the rest of us? And it really is not my intention to be hogging jobs from people. It really is that to do six or seven episodes of something is not as lucrative as 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 one might think. And so to be able to write something at the same time or to potentially be part of a team that produces something else at that time cobbles together a living in a very, very, um, in a very unpredictable business. I mean, look at what's just happened. I mean, we've had a, a worldwide pandemic that has shut down almost every aspect of the business. And who could have predicted such a thing? And I have m- tried to maintain other projects on the different other parts of my life. A, because I have so many different interests and passions, but also because it is far more, it is a smarter way of Mm. moving forward in a business that has so many hidden traps and and so much, uh, such lack of consistency. And uh, so there's a dual benefit to it. Sure. We want a, you know, a realistic approach to this industry. I think traps is a very accurate word for something that, that actors face. 
do you think that your original goal of musical theater, and that was just for performing, right? Is it safe to say that yes. would have that would have led to a little bit less agency than this multi pronged approach you have for TV and film? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, yeah. sometimes the best things come out of. I mean, the, the <laughs> this has been said by so many different people. You know, our failures in life, or our shortcomings, or what 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 we may consider to be bad luck, or Uh, pitfalls, any of those things that happen to us over the course of our careers, especially in the entertainment business, are so often the opportunity for growth in another way. And I um, I can't imagine if, if that had sort of gone well for me, I would have been on a very a much um, more limited path, I think. And my ability to be a creative artist or somebody who creates content or somebody who's able to be creative would have been in the hands of other people always. Yeah. Um, I feel like I often tell young actors the same thing. It's like, look, it is because we're always told to follow our dreams. Follow your dreams. Don't be afraid to dream. I mean, we hear that it's on every bumper sticker. It's it comes out of every message from every motivational speaker. And of mm-hmm. course, we need to dream. But the best thing I think that's happened for me and, I, and the best advice I ever give to kids in their 20s is to not put their fate in the 10 year old's dream. You know, if you're being driven, if you're oh. being driven by a, by a 10 year old's dream, that 10 year old doesn't have any of the wisdom or foresight or logic or experience to guide pivots. And pivots oh. are where everything happens. So when I couldn't get a show, when I was in New York at 22 and I wasn't a good enough dancer or a good enough singer to get a show. I pivoted and I started writing and I pivoted and I moved to Los Angeles. And I, you know, each one of those pivots and each one of those turns comes with a great deal of pain and disappointment, but then it leads down a different path. Right. It is the, maybe the, is it safe to say the the disappointments teach us more than the, (laughs) than the successes? For sure, for sure. I think if I had if I had somehow become extru- extraordinarily successful in my twenties, I don't know whether I would have had the kind of a I don't know how much more understanding and gratitude I would have had for the mm. opportunities that came later, and b I don't know whether I would have pushed myself to drive the projects I wanted to do on my mm. own. That for me were like. Look, I wanted to star in a romantic comedy, and I, there was no way I was going to get hired to be the star of a romantic comedy unless I wrote it myself and cast myself in it. So yes. I made a tiny little movie all over the guy in 2000, which right. is a role that I got because I wrote it and I produced it, and I got to be in it. But that was a perfect example of sort of putting my fate in my own hands out of sheer will and and disappointment in not being able to get those roles from the outside. Right. It's a pivot in its own way. Correct. Well, and I mean, I know you've talked about this plenty, but um, of course, part of what you're saying about not seeing yourself in a romantic comedy lead is the LGBT factor here, where there are certainly, there still are not a lot of, uh, I mean, stories in general about about LGBT people, but certainly an LGBT rom-com. I mean, that must have been part of your inspiration for that particular film. Yes, that film. Well, I had written a play that I that I was in in Los Angeles that was about a guy and a girl. And um, it had, mm-hmm. was suggested to me that I adapt it into a film about two guys. And the, the experiment was to just tell the exact same story, but they just both happened to be boys. And cool to be able to tell a When Harry Met Sally kind of story where the point of it is not coming out of the closet. The point of it is not sexuality, but just... Mm-hmm you know, how hard it is to find love in your 20s, but they both just happen to be guys. That kind of storytelling wasn't happening so much in the late 90s and early 2000s. And so that story of All Over the Guy came out of that experiment. And the LGBT thing is also interesting in that I had a lot of personal growing to do before I became honest enough with myself and with those around me. And the coming out Obviously, I came out, you know, to myself in my 20s, but I didn't really come out in a really substantial way in the business and to other people for another decade. And Mm -hmm. I 
so many of my stumbling blocks as an actor I look back on now had to do with being living a lie in my real life. Uh, oh, wow. You know, pretending every audition I had, I was not only trying to play the role, I was pretending to be a straight actor playing the role. So, you know, there were so many layers that were probably standing in the way of a casting director or a producer or a director connecting to me. And gotcha. it wasn't until way later, it wasn't until way later that I started to feel comfortable with who I was. And then by stripping all that away, I became a much more honest writer and actor. That's so interesting. And it is that thing of, um, for example, uh, your film, it would not have stood out as much if it had to with just that heterosexual element. It's that thing of uh, becoming more yourself is what makes you stand out more. I, I think so. I think that when you are when you can, and it's so hard. I mean, it's a lifetime's work, right? I, I mean, to this day, right. I'm still chasing what does that mean and how much of who I truly am can I expose and when we do I mean I wrote I wrote my book uh, does this baby make me look straight as a way of shedding uh-huh. uh, you know I, I call it sh- the, the shedding of my man spanks I had been so uh-huh. uh, sucked in and and in control of the impressions I would make to other people for so many right. years writing that book was very cathartic because I was really just letting it all hang out for good, bad, and ugly, and humor purposes as well. But this is the kind of person I was as I tried to become a father, and uh, the mistakes I made and the fears I had. And the act of writing it was extremely scary. And, you know, the best things any of us can ever do in our careers, certainly, but I would say in life, are the things that cause us the greatest fear. Yeah, that's great. On this podcast, I feel like we, we, I mean, we're always asking, backstage is always asking for audition advice, but I really find that anytime someone as experienced as you gives audition advice, it often weirdly applies to life. Mm-hmm. And so this idea of like pretending to be a character at an audition, like that that's too many layers, not getting it mm-hmm. real, honest, authentic you, that like that applies to, as you're saying, your life in the biz, but also your, your status as a father. Yes. That's right. I mean, I think that, you know, auditions are the worst. It's so awkward and they're so artificial in a way. Um, People always say, just try to have fun, be yourself. These are all just like tropey bumper sticker Mm. kind of statements that people tell actors. And by the way, they're all true, of course. Right. You know, just listen and respond and be yourself and be honest. And all those things are true. But it's incredibly difficult to do that when you feel like, you know, you're being judged. Um, That said, that said, auditions are opportunities to act. And the best advice I've ever gotten was to look at auditions as just that. It's not a desperate attempt to get a job. It is an opportunity to look at material, learn it, and go in there and perform, which is what we all want to do anyway. And I think You're either, you know, I've learned this from being on the other side of things. You know, I've, I had a, I wrote a pilot once and I read something like 651 actors for a a TV show. Four of the roles out of the six got, were offered to people anyway. And so many of the people who came in were so good. They were so good. They just, for whatever reason, were not exactly Mm -hmm. what was in my brain when I was writing it, but there was nothing about the performance or of the person who came in that, that had did anything wrong. And hmm. that's the hardest thing I think for actors to get, which is like, you just can, you just have to walk in and do it and try to be honest and then forget about it. Um, Jane yeah. Lynch used to always, Jane Lynch used to always say this thing, which I always think about, which is try to care less. You know, okay. people always say you could care less. <laughs> And you're yeah. always saying, you know, of course we care about our careers and of course we have to invest in our work and of course we have to work on our material mm-hmm. and you want to know it and you want to be prepared. Those are all things that are true. But it's really, really important to care less about the immediate results of every action we take. I've gotten the most disappointed and I've learned the hardest lessons when I have not been able to manage my expectations and when I have set a particular result as the bar for whether or not something I've done was could right. be deemed as a success or not. Um, if your only bar is to get a job, then ever, then so many of the auditions are just going to feel like failures. And if the if the goal is to walk in and 
perform for those seven to 17 minutes, then you leave and you've done it. You've done your job and you can move on to the next thing. I mean, I, you know, it sounds so much easier said than done, believe me. Yeah. And I have, to this day, I have tortured over things that I really wanted and didn't get. But the truth is, it's, it's a fluke when you do get something. You never really, in terms of the odds, you're never really supposed to get anything. Right. Um, the, the odds are always against you. So it is a fluke when you get the job. It's a fluke when the job comes back for more, like a series. It's a fluke when you get a pilot. Yeah. It's a fluke when the pilot's picked up to series. And it's a fluke when the series gets another season. Um, those things we have so little control over. Yeah, th this is all really, I think, really important, especially for early career actors to rem remember. Like, I think it's such a good point what you're saying about if you're on the other side of the table, you can see that an actor is not necessarily doing anything wrong. It's no. kind of like you, you have to do everything right. And then like you're saying, you, there's a fluke factor <laughs> or almost yes. luck or circumstance or any number of things. They're completely out it's, of the actor's it, control. It, this is the thing. It is about controllable versus uncontrollable variables. In every yes. single person's life, we have to weigh at all times, what are the things, what are the variables that I can control and what are the variables I can't control? You know, we are all learning right now with this pandemic, an enormous lesson in uncontrollable variables. There are things that we yes. just absolutely can't control. If, if, our, if our shows are shut down, if our jobs are making us stay home, if all these things are happening that are, that are impeding our freedoms, those are uncontrollable variables. But the variables you can control are choices that you make, other areas, other creative interests that we're able to pursue. Um, mm -hmm. Taking pen to paper. One reason I became a writer is because it's something I can actually do. Whether I sell it or not, I can, I can type into my laptop every single day without someone right. telling me I have a job or hiring me. Um, that's a controllable variable. I don't do it nearly enough, and that's my sure. own problem. But, <laughs> but actors... By definition, actors need an audience, need, need a, a person to hire them, and need a director, and need material. They are unbelievably, by design, the, have the least amount of control. And so, you know, the more, you can, the more variables that you can give yourself to control, the better, which means finding other interests, finding other passions in the business or out of the business, and letting those fill you as a human so that the only validation you're looking for in life is not coming from acting. It's really wonderful advice, especially as you're saying to hear right now. I mean, what a beautiful segue to, I, mean, I wanted to ask you about advice on what working artists can do in quarantine or, you know, staying at home. I think putting pen to paper, as you're saying, even if there's no guarantee of that of anything coming of that as yes. you're as you're saying i love this idea of um variables in your in your control in your control is yeah. putting pen to paper even if it's gibberish right yes in fact i would suggest that people write every single day with mm -hmm. no intention of it ever getting read when you sure. sit down to write a screenplay you have in your head that you're going to try to sell it and you and instantly the the commerce of it gets into your brain and gotcha. impedes the creative process. But if you're just gonna write, sit down to write a scene that, uh, that occurs to you, whether anyone's ever gonna read it or not, a character you've always wanted to write, a problem, a joke, a, a scenario, a sketch, a, a something creative, whether it leads to something that one day may be you know, marketable or sellable or performable, right. That's not your concern at the moment. The best things that we can do are open up, a, you know, open up a pad of paper or a computer, and just put our thoughts or ideas down because we can control that. Um, and the, I would say the same thing about almost everything, that, especially in quarantine. It's like I, I, one yeah. of the reasons I've become an obsessive baker in the last three weeks. <laughs> is because it's about controllable variables. I, there's yeah. nothing I can control in my environment. But if I know that if I put these exact quantities of these exact ingredients together and it comes out two hours later as a cake, it, there's, such a, there's something so satisfying about it that cannot be replicated in almost any other part of our lives. Yeah, it's very comforting. It brings comfort to have that kind of it, control. 
It does. And in fact, knitting, you know, like just knit. You don't have to knit because you want to one day sell your oh, yeah. scarves on Etsy. It could be knit because if something satisfying about, you know, rhythmic and, and kind of meditative about, about moving our hands and allowing ourselves to create something with our hands, it doesn't have to be something that one day becomes a career path. But these are things that while we're in captivity, as I call it, um, can make us feel productive. I also think there's, ages and ages ago, while I was at Vassar, I took a semester at the National Theater Institute at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center. And- um, Oh, amazing. (laughs) There there was a woman married to Jack Guilford, the actor, who named Madeline Guilford, who had a piece of advice that every single one of us who were there, all of us students, we were all like barely 20 at the time, but it was something that I've thought about for the rest of my career, which is like, do one thing every single day for your career mm-hmm. and do one thing every single day for another actor. And it doesn't mean spend oh. the entire day doing something for your career or spend the entire day for another actor. It was like, even if for five minutes you do something that is just for you, whether it's a note to a producer, director, casting director that you haven't kept in touch with in a long time, or it's to read a play that you haven't read in a long time, or it's to find a piece of work that you, whatever it might be, one thing every single day that reminds you and that fills you as an actor, because it's about, again, controllable variables, and also to do one small thing, and this is much more truth, this is much more relevant to younger actors. You know, when we were all doing each other favors in New York, to do one thing for somebody else uh, is such a good piece of advice because paying it forward like that, it, you know, you add up those days and those favors 10 years later, and there's all of these, there's all this karma that comes back to you in different ways that you don't even know about. Building relationships is a very difficult thing to do, and it's a very important thing to do. And you don't want to be building relationships with just the only, with the only purpose of <laughs> of one day having somebody employ sure. you, you know, you, you want to yeah. build friendships and build family and f- start a life. And, you know, I met Lisa Kudrow because my husband uh, directed a movie called The Opposite of Sex. And she came to set and we discovered we both went to Vassar and there and <laughs> started a friendship. But it wouldn't have happened had I not met Don and been in a committed relationship with him and supported right. him in the making of his film. And suddenly I was on set with Lisa and a year later she was appearing in my movie. And two years later we were starting, or three years later we were starting a company together. This is why I'm always saying people, people should really move forward in creating lives for themselves, building relationships. You know, whether you get married or not, you know, as you move forward in life and growing your life in ways that are outside of the business, oddly will feed the work you do in the business. The through line I'm hearing here, which is really fabulous advice is when you're working on your stuff, which is the stuff that's in your control, take the industry part and the career ambitions off the table. For example, with writing, it can, is it safe to say it can almost inhibit your writing if you're only thinking, well, how can I sell this? How can I sell this? It's the worst. It's the worst. And and, and I've been writing for television for so many years. I Often the worst thing that happens to me is when I'm trying to come up with an idea that I think will sell. It's almost always the wrong motivation. Right. When I'm writing something that comes from a real experience or a real inspiration that came to yeah. me or something that, that is very truthful or honest, that could only be written by me, it could only be told by me. Those are the things that A, tend to sell and B, are written so much more easily because they they are coming from a place of authenticity. And that's the same thing with relationships. If you're trying to build your Rolodex, oh, that's an old term. I just aged myself. When you're trying to build your you're trying to <laughs> when you're trying to build your contacts w- with the hopes that that will become your network to work, you're less likely to build a network that will eventually get you work. But when you build your life, and, and friends and support them in their creative ventures and you wind up collaborating and deciding that two like-minded people want to maybe create something together and then they bring in the people that they want to work with and those people become your lifelong friends. I mean, oddly enough, that is how so many of the greatest talents in the film and television and theater industry were created. 
you know, friendships that became creative collaborations and vice versa. Yeah. Like the, it's almost like do it for the love of the craft and do it for creating a life through those series of pivots and flukes and everything. That's what emerges from that more organic. Yeah. I mean, it's tricky because you also want to be driven. I mean, I can't say that I, you know, I had right. a lot of tenacity. I, if some would say, I, I mean, it took me 20 years to sort of get what I wanted out of the business. And many would have argued if it's going to take that long, is it even worth it? Um, but I mean, for me, it wasn't like that was the only thing I was doing. And, it, and I wasn't really even thinking about it by the time it happened. By the time I got offered the part on Scandal, I wasn't even really thinking about having an acting career like that anymore. I certainly wanted to act, but I was gotcha. producing with Lisa and I was writing pilots and I was would occasionally go out on things, but I wasn't so driven to have only that in my life. And um, I had written a book and the right. book introduced me to Shonda and I did an episode of Grey's Anatomy. And it was it's just interesting how it happened mm -hmm. out of being who I am more than it happened out of any kind of strategic right. move. There's not some schematic of, okay, I want to win an Emmy oh, no. for acting on a show and then let's work backwards from Absolutely there. Absolutely <laughs> not. I mean, I hate to, I hate to dispel the <laughs> believers in the secret and creative visualization, but I visualized, right. I visualized many a role. <laughs> I visualized many a part. I visualized many an award over the years. And, um, they didn't necessarily happen that way. And I just went, I was minding my own business and I was being myself and I was living my life. And I wound up on a show that wound up giving me material like I couldn't have imagined getting to play with actors that only made me better because they were so accomplished and so skilled. And I was fortunate enough to, you know, to be, it's, all just, just it all kind of unraveled in a way that I in a million years would never have imagined. And it's not until you look back on it that it makes any kind of sense. <laughs> That's right. That's right. When you do look yeah. back on it, you're like, well, I guess I guess there were all these little stepping stones that sort of led to that, but they weren't predictable. They weren't planned. Right. You know, it, it but people see in you either desperation and drive single, you know, and that's kind of single focus, mm. or they see in you a dynamic, well-balanced, passionate, driven, creative, interested in multiple things. You know, those kinds of qualities yeah. will lead you to do many different things, which ironically might lead to the opportunity that you were always hoping for. Right. It's that it's, I love that it's almost a distinction between driven and desperate. There's driven in both scenarios, yeah. but it's not like you created a relationship with Shonda Rhimes or Lisa Kudrow for the purpose of getting hired for something. That would be no, absolutely right, and maybe even creepy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I didn't. I mean, I think they kind of fell. They were things that sort of I was on a path, and there they emerged, and I right. wouldn't have expected it. And and uh, I think that's what was and i was living my life as an uh, you know by that point i was living my life with my at the time long-term boyfriend and mm -hmm. didn't even have kids yet but um so much of my relationship with shonda was based on the fact that you know i wrote this book about adoption and she had adopted and mm -hmm. we had bonded over our adoption stories well so many things have to have happened for you to bond with someone over your adoption story. You have to be, I had to be honest about who I was and what my relationship was and how I was going to become a father and connect with another artist who also had their own path to, to motherhood. And you suddenly find this very personal point of connection, which then later became a point of connection creatively as well. Right. Professionally. Yes. That's really beautiful. <laughs> that really really gives, I think, anyone at any point in their career kind of hope. Uh, listen, I tell everybody, if you can live without a career in the entertainment business, you absolutely should. Run, <laughs> run, don't look back. <laughs> but if you can't, yes. if you can't, then the most important thing to do is to live a life bigger than your career. Oh. Go and you know, have kids and, or if you want them and have a, a, a meaningful relationship, if that, you know, if that comes to you and if that's right. something that, but fill your life with things outside of the business, because 
um, it will consume you otherwise. And it will define your worth and your value based on things that should never define our worth or our value. Wonderful. Yeah, I've never heard it quite put that way of like, you can have a, you can go for a big career and the career can be big, but maybe not if it eclipses the personal, the life stuff. Oh my God. And I, I have to teach this to myself every day. I'm, you sure. know, I'm constantly disappointed because, you know, I'll try to increase my social media following, but with a certain, you know, because I'm, because nowadays this is what we have to do. And, and to put some kind of number on our popularity, like a right. number of Twitter followers or Instagram followers is so um, damaging to the, to the psyche and to this, to our <laughs> egos, if you let it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so many times trying to find your value based on how much you're seen, how much you're liked in quotes and not in yeah. quotes. Um, these are things that are externals that we have very little control over. And um, I, have to t I have to tell myself every day that that's not where my value comes from. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly speaking from experience, but I'm not speaking as though I don't have to continually remind myself, yeah. you know, not to be disappointed because, you know, I didn't get booked on a particular talk show because I wasn't famous enough or I didn't have enough, you know, or mm -hmm. or I didn't get a particular job because they were looking for a bigger name or I didn't hit a million followers. So I'm not going to get a, a brand opportunity. These are things that just are realities in our business, but they do not make us better or worse at what we do. Mm, yeah. And frankly, it's not a lesson you just learn and you've mastered it. Like, like you're saying, you got to reteach yourself maybe every day. Yes. And that really does speak to this moment. It's, I mean, we are really at a moment where we're learning what's important and it is an opportunity to kind of get back in touch with basic life lessons. Like this is in your control and this is a lot that's out of your control. And so yes. here's what you can do. Don't go beyond that. And again, the, the variables in your control are different for every person, but it is important mm. to wake up each day and be like, well, what, what can I do? What do I know I can do? I know I can walk. I know I can exercise. I know I can meditate. I know I can write. I know I can reach out to somebody. I know I can volunteer. I know I can, you know, it doesn't mean you have to be selfless. You can be selfish too, but mm. the things that a person can do that they have control over um, and maybe that does mean down the line coming up with an idea that one eventually wants to present to the industry. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you're not tying your entire self-worth into that idea or the sellability of something. It's very hard to sell. It's very hard to sell shows these days. It's very hard to keep shows on the air. I mean, everything is virtually impossible. So <laughs> if you're, it, it's like a loser's game if you're looking to fill yourself and feel a sense of value and worth um, from the validation of the industry through jobs and roles and awards. Award seasons are just the industry rewarding itself and congratulating itself, which I think is great. And believe me, I feel extremely fortunate that I even had that experience in, in my lifetime. Mm. But it just makes you want more of it. And it just makes you think that the answers to where your value comes from are outside of you. And that the daily lesson for me, and I think for every artist, 22, 42, or 62, is to remember the, the value that, that is within their control. Huntsville, Alabama in 1946, a city that was as American as Apple Strudel? From LA Times Studios comes Paperclip, a podcast sponsored by Amazon Studios and inspired by its Emmy-eligible dramatic series, Hunters, starring Al Pacino and Logan Lerman. Join host Michael Ian Black as he teams up with a Cold War scholar to explore Operation Paperclip, a real-life, top-secret program that brought Nazi scientists to the American heartland to work on government aerospace and medical research projects. Available now on Apple Podcasts and all other platforms. I'd love to ask you some very quick backstagey questions, the kind of questions we ask basically everyone we talk to. For example, where did you get your SAG or equity card, and could that be considered your big break? 
I think I got my equity card. Oh my God. I don't rem. It was such a long time ago. I think I got my equity card playing Eugene in a Neil Simon play at the Lake George Dinner Theater, which was the smallest dinner theater in the country at the time, <laughs> and was so tiny that the theater was built inside the conference room of a Holiday Inn. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, where I performed that Broadway bound for four straight months, eight shows a week. Um, wow. That's where I got my equity card. I can't say that was my big break. Right. You know, how does one define a big break? I, I don't really know. Uh, I spent most of my youth thinking about this is it, always thinking that this is going to be the thing. Uh, um, and every time I thought this was going to be the thing, it never was. So A, whatever the definition of, I remember when I made my movie all over the guy, I thought I was going to get a gap ad. For whatever reason, the symbol of success to me would have been if the cast had been asked to do a gap ad. And so I kept thinking like, well, if we get a gap ad out of this, then it will mean that we broke through and the movie was a success and I'm a success. Well, of course, no gap ad came out of a tiny little gay film like that. But um <laughs> So I don't even know if that movie was my break, although it was one of many breaks. Um, mm. My SAG card, I got doing an industrial. Remember industrials? I don't know if people still make them anymore. Yeah, sure. Um, it was like a training video, I think, that was shot in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. It was either for haagen or for some kind of office politics video. Oh, wow. Um, but I got my, it was very unglamorous. Let me put it that way. <laughs> office politics. That sounds great. Yeah. What is one performance every actor should see and why? Oh my gosh. <laughs> one performance every actor or actress should see. Yes. Well, there's about a thousand of those. I don't even know where to begin, but one that I think is essential is Norma Leandra in, uh, Norma Leandro is an Argentinian actress oh. who won the Oscar for an Argentinian film called The Official Story. It, it's a performance that is just remarkable and uh, raw and honest and amazing. So every actor and actress should definitely see that. Um, but boy, a lot of our great uh, actors uh, have uh, can be put in that category. I mean, there, are, my God, there's performances in Meryl Streep that should be seen by everybody and, hmm. and um, of course, um, and Jack Nicholson, and um, I mean, there's just so many. Uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman in The Graduate, oh my God. Mm. But um, yeah, those are three. That's great. Um, do you have a worst audition horror story? Oh my God, almost every single one of them. <laughs> but um, I have two. One of them was a dance audition. I was way, way, oh. way back when I was first out of college. I, again, I was, I was telling you, I was taking dance classes three times a week. Yeah. And I got sent on an audition for some soda commercial for Japan. Oh my. And the, dan the dance audition was so hard. And I was in a room with so many talented dancers that I just stood there in a group of 40 <laughs> dancers and just, I didn't move. Oh, no. I, I guess I felt like if I, if I stood perfectly still, nobody would see me. <laughs> and yet when you're the only one not moving in a crowd, you are the most <laughs> visible person. So it was a complete nightmare. Um, and another one I had was an audition for a TV show. And I brought so many props with me. Big, big mistake. It was quite embarrassing to, to remove books and an apple and an easel and wow. a pair of sneakers. It was, I was a little too method and it was mortifying and they all started laughing. And I, needless to say, did not get to perform on that television series. They all started laughing at you? Or with you? They, they were laughing at the situation. Okay. Well, <laughs> there was a very fine line uh, on that day, yes. <laughs> Um, okay, what is, uh, we sort of, you touched on this, but if you were to give your younger self one piece of advice, maybe your college age self, what would that be? Um, have as much sex as possible, because <laughs> if you, if I'd only known uh. I was going to wind up in a 28 year old marriage as young as I did, <laughs> I, I really, I, I didn't, I didn't take advantage of my youth. Uh, no, the, the best piece of advice I think I could give anybody and I think I said it earlier in, in our conversation, is don't put your future dreams in the hands of a 10-year-old's of a yeah. mind. 
That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that I, I was driven for such a long time by dreams I that 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 started in my youth. Mm. And I think I didn't realize how important it was to evolve them yeah. and pivot with, you know, them and adapt my dreams to reality. Because otherwise you wind up 30 and you're not accomplishing what your 10 year old mm. had set out to accomplish. And of course not, because a 10 year old doesn't know what goes into <laughs> right. the realities of all those things. Yeah. So that, that's, that's a lot of it. Yeah. Um, and also, and like Jane Lynch said to me a million times, care a little bit less. Yeah, that's It's excellent. not all the things we think are going to make or break us. They don't make us and they really don't break us. Yeah. And as you said earlier, too, like as we've been saying, you got to relearn these things. It's not oh, you yeah. once and oh, yeah. <laughs> that's right. you've mastered it. That's right. Well, this yeah. has been really great. Dan, thank you. This is like a guide to how to be a hyphenate in the industry. And we really yes. appreciate that. Well, it's my pleasure. And I hope that um, we can also mention The Baker and the Beauty, which is premiering on Monday. I don't know when this is going to drop. but Me neither, um, but yes. <laughs> um, it, is, it is a new series that uh, we'll it's be lovely. playing through the rest of April and May and into June. And I'm very proud of it. So I hope people will check it out. And you've been baking yourself, and I feel like so much of yes, the appeal of that show lot. is like the beautiful food on that show, and like just like the yes. comforts of baking. And well, it's, the whole the whole show is comfort food at a time where we really need it. Yeah. So um, I'm glad it's coming out when it is. Yeah. Well, wonderful, Dan. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.